starting a new series of lessons and it's living the faith. And our first lesson for March 3rd, 2019 is God will finish the work. And our focus thought is we must allow God to complete the work he has started in our lives. And our focus verse is Philippians 1 and 6. And it reads, being confident of this very thing, that we, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Our lesson text is a relatively short one, so I'll just read through it. It's coming from Acts 23 the verses 11 through 14 and it reads and the night following the Lord stood by him and said be of good uh, good cheer Paul for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem so must thou bear witness also at Rome and when it was day certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul and they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy and they, made, and they came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now, God will finish the work. So as we, we look through the lesson, you know, each one of us have been called. Well, let me ask this. Is there anyone who's saved just to go to heaven? Is that the only reason that we are saved? Why, why does God save us? Part of the reason. What is the responsibility after you receive salvation? I guess that's the better question. Do we know what we're supposed to do after we get saved? There is no, there are no spectators in Christ. Right? Everyone who is called into salvation there is a work for us to do now it said the, the lesson states that God will finish the work what work what work will God finish if we look at Philippians 1 and 6 being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ can somebody expound on that a little bit on that, that our focus verse, anybody, amen. So there, there is, like Brother Malone said, there are two different callings. One, we're called to salvation, and then we're called to do a work for God. Now, God, he, he, he does an individual work, but then he does work, a work within that he, he, God started a redemptive work. And, and we know, like when we talk about the finished work of God, like from, the beginning of Genesis to the end, you know, and we, we can see the, 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 the final result of God's work in, in Revelation. You know, when he reestablishes his kingdom here on earth, he dwells among his people. That's his ultimate goal. Now, he started that work back in Genesis. You know, so everything that we read in these scriptures from Genesis to Revelation is leading us to that ultimate end. You know, God's ultimate plan of being among his people. Now, as Brother Malone stated, you know, the devil, he does everything he can to sidetrack that, but there is nothing that he can do that, that can stop the work of God. Now, that's, that's from, now, who was Paul talking to in Philippians 1 and 6? Who is he talking to? Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Who is Paul talking to? Believers. To the church at Philippi, right? To the Philippians. He was talking to the church. You know? So this work that God has begun in the church, he's going to perform it until the day that Jesus returns for his church. What is that work? What is that good work? Spreading another good, good news? From the time that you're brought into salvation, there is a maturing process that begins. So this good work, this maturing, bring, bringing the church into maturity. That's a consistent and a constant thing within us. You're never 
get to a point where you know everything there is to know. You've grown to a point where there is no more growth in Christ. There is not a time when there isn't some deeper revelation that you can get of God. So this good work that he begins is a, a work of maturity. So you can go be a witness unto God. You know? Now, we, now the, the focus thought said we must allow God. Now, we can put a halt to it in our own personal lives, but we cannot stop the ultimate or the grand scheme of things, the ultimate plan of God. Now, our part in the, in the plan, we can definitely be a hindrance, you know, it cause unnecessary delay, I would say. But we must allow God to do a work within us. Now, we're looking at Paul, and Paul, he was going, he, he was facing challenges, you know, now, when we talk about the God will finish the work, like, and it says that, that, you know, the Lord came to Paul and he told him that he would bear witness in Rome, same way he did in Jerusalem. Now, from what I understand, Paul ultimately met his death in, in Rome. But from the time that, that he saw Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus up to this point, all of this was leading him to Rome. Now, when we see this in, in, in the night, looking at Acts 23, 11, and 14, and the night following the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear, us witness, bear witness also at Rome. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. So, at this point, we have conspirators. So, what happened following this conspiracy? Anybody know? And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. What happened next? Paul's nephew overheard the conversation. He went to the centurions and, and, and ultimately they protected Paul, long story short. With us, with the believers, you know, we've all been called unto salvation, but also from your very birth, there are certain gifts, there are certain abilities, there are certain characteristics that God has planted in you to fulfill the purpose that he set forth for your life. Now, do we actively seek God for our purpose? Do we recognize God's hands in our life? So when you, when you get hired for a job, what's, what is the process? What is the process for getting hired for a physical job? When, when you get hired for a job, do they just say, okay, go to work? Or do they tell you what you're supposed to do? Or do you make up and decide what you're supposed to do? What is that? Hmm? Where do you go through a training? Okay, but before you go through a training, you're training for what? Before, you, before they train you, they're training you for a specific purpose, right? right. That's not what, you don't decide what you're gonna do, no. right? We don't decide what we're gonna do for God, right? God tells us or he shows us what we're supposed to do, right? Now, that's based on things that he's already implanted in us, right? Do we tell God what we want to do? Lord, I want to be a singer. Lord, I want to be a preacher. And he say, okay, do that. Or does he lead you down that path to show you what you're supposed to be? Now, my next question is, when you're on a job, does everybody do the same job? If you're working on an assembly line and one person is supposed to nail it together, if everybody nailing it together, then does that finish the product? Right? So step two, the second thing is that we're not all called to do the same thing. Right? Everybody's not called to be a preacher. Everybody's not called to sing. Everybody's not called to be a worship leader or a teacher or an evangelist, you know, or a prophet. That's not everybody's calling. That's not everybody's purpose. That's not everybody's work. So the first thing that we have to do is determine what our job is. What, 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 what assignment does God have me on? Now we all have a general calling to work for Christ, but within that there is a individual calling for each one of us. Something that God has set for only you to accomplish. You, this is your part in the grand plan. As, as you 
get closer to God and you get a deeper revelation of, 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 of God, he'll start to reveal more and more your purpose. And then, then you go through that training that, 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 and then we constantly, it's constant on the job training for us. You know, we come in here, we get instruction, we get encouragement, we get a motivation, you know, and then we go back to work, you know. But we got to work. So God has called us to do a work, which, which he will finish. And then God does a work within us. And as I stated, this work is, is it's a work to bring us into maturity. Now, growing in God, maturing in God, is not always easy. There are going to be some hardships. There are going to be some trials. There are going to be some tests. But even with that, God's grace is sufficient, similar to what he told Paul. So the thing is, is that every situation that we find ourselves in, everything that God allows to help us, I mean, to, to enter our lives, is to help us. And I was looking, if you read further in Philippians, and, and if you look at Philippians, the same chapter, 1 and 12, and, and Paul said, tells the, the church that, but I would ye understand, brethren, that these things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Everything that happened to Paul, every persecution, every time he went to jail, every time he was beaten, every time he was lied on, it was towards the furthering of the gospel. 13, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palaces and all the other places. If I wasn't in jail, it wouldn't spread like this, you know. I'm talking, I'm able to talk to the jailers, I'm talking to these soldiers, they're talking to other people about something that I said, so the gospel is still spreading. It's through my hardship, though. It was through his hardship. It was, it was, he told somebody who told somebody who told somebody. The gospel was being spread. 14, and many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident of my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Again, it's because I'm going through it and they can watch me go through it. Then they're more bold. They're more confident. They're not scared when they're facing the same trials that I'm facing because they see me go through it and they see my faith in Christ and how God is, is bringing me through these things. It's the same thing with us. Everything that you go through, people are watching you. You know, we're, we're to be witnesses. We're to be examples. This is part of the work of drawing people into the kingdom. So the hardships that you go through, people are watching how you handle it, just like they were watching Paul. And it's some people... If, if you can go through it, I can go through it too. And this is for believers. Also, for us. If, you, if, I, if I could watch Brother Clarence go through a trial and God brings him through, if I'm faced with that same situation, then my faith is just a little stronger. Why? Because I saw God do it for Brother Clarence. And God is of no respected person. If he did it for him, he can do it for me. And then my faith is that if he chooses not to do it for me, then he's still in control. My, my route is to go, a I'm to go a different route. But even with that, because it didn't work, and even with that, that's for the next person. If God chooses to work it out differently for me, that might be for Sister Julia. You know? God, God everything that we go through, everything that we face, it's, it's to the furthering of the work to getting further to that completion. You know, again, so just going further with Philippians. And, and the next verse, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of God. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn into my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the, the spirit of, the, of Jesus Christ. What, what, what was Paul just saying there? His ultimate goal was the spreading of the gospel. He didn't care how it was spread. And that's what he was saying. Some, some of the people that were preaching Christ, they were doing it for self gain or they were doing it out of jealousy of him just to be out there. Some were doing it out of love, but some, like he said, were doing it out of contention and, and rivalry. But either way, the message was the same. That was his ultimate goal. You know, 
And with us, we, we have to understand that we have a, in comparison, a relatively small part to play in God's grand plan, uh, individually. You know, you're not going to do it all. That's what I'm saying. You know, you're a part of it. You're not the plan. You're a part of the plan. You know, so with Paul, he understood that. That, that some people, you know, I'm not going to be able to reach everybody everywhere. So I'm going to do my part. I'm going to do my job, what God has called me to do. You know, now we here in this local assembly, this local congregation, and we always bring it home, like, we, we have a, a work to do in our own community here in Bahia. We have a, a work to do within this congregation, this ministry, by way outreach, you know, an active role. Nobody is called to this ministry to sit and watch. We're all supposed to do something. You know, everybody may not be up in front of the people, but there's still a work to be done, right? What is that work? When souls to the kingdom, that's right. How do we do that? How do you win a soul? Is it a, a, a how, do you, how do we win souls to the kingdom? Um, question. Typically on a job, you know, when you get hired, you get allocated, you know, PTO, paid time off, or a few vacation days. How many vacation days do we get in God's work? How many vacation days are allotted? Once you're, you're saved, you're hired, how many vacation days do we get? Anybody? Rick Curtis, how many vacation days do we get with God's work? Yeah. We don't get no time off, right? Why do we act like we do? One thing that, that for us, and even myself, speaking especially to myself, is making God's work top priority over everything else. The thing that God has for me, because I, you know, if I'm about God's business, he'll be about mine. Seek ye first the kingdom, and all these things will be added. You know, so me talking to Kendrick, I have to make a conscious decision to make God's work top priority over everything else. Because there are no days off. There, there is no time. I don't get a vacation day. I can't call in to God and say, you know what, I'm going to take today off. I'll pick it up tomorrow. You know, that, that, that's, that's not it. There is no time off. Whether we feel like it, you know, physically, it may be a little challenging because you, the body does get tired. But if we believe God to be a provider, what does God provide? When we say God is a provider, do we only think God is a provider of financial and, 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 and material things? Or do we believe that he is a provider of everything that pertains to me? He's a provider of my health. He's a provider of my strength. He's a provider of my energy. You know, I've, I've heard, you know, multiple preachers and, and, you know, they say, you know, the body real weary, they run a revival and they just tired until they get up in front of the people and God endows them with this supernatural energy. Now, when they get through ministering, they may be exhausted back to exhaustion, but God supplied the he provided what they needed for that time do we believe God to provide for us in everything especially when we're about his work do we trust him for that you know I went through my own challenge this week about trusting God with something you know and I went back and forth with that thing you know now ultimately I decided I just got to trust him you know, it was a financial matter. And for me, and for most men, trusting God with financial matters may be a little more difficult because you are called to be providers for your family. And you don't want to put any type of undue stress on them, you know. But ultimately, I had to, to trust him, you know. That's the work that God is doing in me that I have to allow him to finish this work of trusting him. I can't compare the job or the work that I do for God to the work that you do, you know? 
I can't go to God and say, well, they are only doing this. It don't matter what they're only doing. It only matters what I'm doing. You know? Now, with this work, will there be opposition? Will there be opposition? Or everything we, everything we put our hands to is going to succeed the first time? No. Right? So we're going to face opposition. You know, one of the things that the lesson says is that the enemy wishes to stop the work of God or the work God is doing in us. But with that, the enemy's plans will never surprise God. There's nothing that Satan can bring against you that's going to catch God off guard where he have to, has to improvise. Does God improvise in your life? <laughs> Do you think God improvises? Something that, you, improvisation is, is something that catches you off guard. So now you have to, you had an original plan, but now I got to do something different to try to circumvent this unexpected situation. Do we serve a God like that? God doesn't improvise. Therefore, there's nothing that Satan can bring against you that catches him off guard. How can all things work for the good of those who love him if he's caught off guard? God can use an unbeliever to, to, to further his plan. That's what he did in this particular. When, when, when these Jews conspired, it was 40 of them. So Paul's nephew heard, and then he came to Paul and Paul, and Paul sent him to talk to one of the chief centurions. And based on that, the centurion wasn't a believer. It, I don't see where it says that he was a convert, you know, but God using him and, and it says that he got roughly 200 soldiers, 200 spearmen and 70 mounted troops to escort Paul. That was for 40 people. So he got roughly what, 470 soldiers to escort Paul to Felix. So what does that tell me? That them that are for me are greater than those that are against me. Always. You know, hey, 470. He could have just got 40. You know, one on one, we can take them. But he went, 200 soldiers ready to leave for Caesarea, take 200 spearmen and 70 mounted troops. How many is that? That's 470, right? All day. It's very rarely that you, that you read in scripture where Jesus wasn't doing something, where he wasn't on the move, where he wasn't preaching, teaching, healing, ministering to people. He was always working. And when he wasn't working, he was praying, which is still work. So either he was praying or he was working. Now, if he's our example, and I know that we have jobs, but what are the two most important things, two, two very important aspects, prayer, and work, you know, pray, get your instruction, talk to God, you know, you get strength, you know, and, and there, there are things that, that God will tell you one-on-one -on -one that you may not hear over the pulpit, you know, and, and like the bishop, he was saying, like, God, sometimes God needs somebody to ask for something. Actually, you know, as we, when we, we talk about, you know, interceding, sometimes God wants somebody to ask for him to step in. Invite me to do something. You know, that's, that's a work within itself. Inter intercession, you know, that, that's a work within itself. You know, some people, everybody ain't called to, to be an intercessor. Everybody don't have that same love or same compassion or same want to be able to pray for other people like they would pray for themselves, to stand in the gap. You know? Again, it's just about finding your job. What, what is your role? What does God want you to do? You know, and we were talking, you know, like Brother Malone said, you, you'll run across opposition. You know, you, you may have enemies. You know, we have an enemy, you know, 
you know, Satan and all his demons. Like they, they are in opposition to what we we had we want to do. You know, but there is nothing that he can do or nothing that he can bring about that's going to surprise God. You know, some of the greatest lessons that you'll learn, you learn through trials, through challenges. You know, you and and James. Um, why we and it kind of brought me to the scripture. Uh, looking at James chapter one and verse two, starting with verse two, and it says, "My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience." Now, this what is what is worketh patience? What is that? That means you gain experience through the trying of your faith. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So the work that, I, as I stated at the beginning of the lesson, the work that God does within us is a work of maturity, bringing us to maturity. They're gonna be what they call growing pains. You know, they're gonna be challenges. Your faith is gonna be tested. <laughs> you know, but the apostle, he's saying, count it all joy. Why? Because the trying of your faith, faith worketh experience. It's almost like Brother Bogart said, if your faith is never tried, how do you know that you actually have faith? It's, it's, it's easy enough to say it, but if you don't ever have to exercise faith, how do you know that you have faith? Brother Jimmy, how do you know you got faith? Do you have faith? How do you know? So basically, you had to exercise faith to know that you had faith. You had to put it to work. Right. Yeah. So everybody can expect to face some type of challenge at some point. We may not all face the same challenges, but there's going to be opposition as God tries to do, as God does a work within you and he calls you to do a work in this world. You know, you can expect that. You can plan for it. You know, you just know what's coming. You know. And, and, and the closer that you get to God, you know, it seems that the more challenges you may face, you know. Why? Because now you're a bigger threat to the agenda of the devil, you know. If you're not facing challenges, you may want to be concerned. I'm going to say that. If you're not facing any challenge, if the devil isn't, trying you at some point, you know, then you may, you know, want to take a little peek, see where you are, you know, because I, yeah, but we all face challenges and it's a matter of growing, growing, maturing. We all want to grow. We all want to mature in Christ because we all want to work for God, right? That's our ultimate goal, to work for God. After Jesus went through his 40 days of, of fasting and he was tempted by the devil, what does it say? The devil left him for a season, right? What does that mean? Did he leave him alone altogether or did he just step, take a step back and regroup? I'm going to try him again. Now, this is Jesus now. This is the Christ. So it's, it's not to a point where you get so close where the devil like, it ain't, I, you ain't even, it ain't even worth trying you because I know it ain't going to, you know what I'm saying? He don't never stop trying. He, he always has some imp, demon assigned to you, <laughs> just for you, you know, to try to make you fall or lead you, to cause you to fall. You know, so we're going to face challenges at every level that you reach. The challenges are different. You know, something, something that may have been a challenge to you when you first got saved may not be a challenge to you now that you've been following Christ and you've gotten closer to him. You know, that's that work of maturity. You know, things that I got upset about when I was 21, I don't get upset about now. Why? Because I'm mature, experienced. You know, I've gone through some things. You know, so God will finish the work. God will bring you. If we allow him, he will finish that work within you to bring you to maturity. He will finish his work in the earth. You know, how does this, how does the story end? Do we know? 
How does it all, what, what is the final? Victory. Yeah, huh? Say that again. Victory. Victory. Right. Anybody else know? How does, how does it end for the believers? Okay. Okay. Would you like to expound on that? Um, <laughs> what, what is our final destination? What is our destiny as a believer? Eternal life. Eternal life, right. Anybody read Revelation? I mean, it's not a trick question. Like, he tells us what's going to be. It's going to be a new earth. It's going to be a new heaven. He's going to bring, he's going to dwell among his people, right? That's, that's what we're living for, right? That's what we're striving for. That's the work that he's going to finish, right? When he reestablishes his kingdom physically on earth. Is that not what we're, we, we want to be partakers of? Right? If not, then what, what are we doing? If that's not your ultimate goal, to be a partaker in eternal life with Christ Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So we want to continue to allow God to do a work in us so we can do a work for him, working with him. Right. That's our ultimate goal. Are there any comments, any questions? Anybody got anything to say?